Hi, I'm Olivia Mattis, welcoming you on behalf of the Sousa Mendes Foundation. We represent a Portuguese hero, Aristides de Sousa Mendes, who saved so many lives during World War II. And usually our programs on Sundays are film and discussion programs to do with the history of the Holocaust. Today, we're looking at another period, another aspect of Jewish history, and that is basically the aftermath of the terrible inquisition of Spain and Portugal. Now, uh, today is Cinco de Mayo, which uh, is uh, appropriate, and um, it's also um, a Holocaust Remembrance Day tomorrow. And so uh, we remember the victims and the heroes of the Holocaust. So um, on today's program, we are um, partnering with an organization called the Unity Through Diversity Institute and its executive director, Drora Arusi, who will be your moderator. And she works very closely with our guest of honor, Jeannie Milgram, and together they have developed something called the Certificate of Sephardic Ancestry. And uh, you have seen a beautiful film uh, starring uh, Jeannie Milgram talking about her life story. And uh, she's really one of the foremost genealogists um, of Jewish history, Jewish genealogists uh, in the world today. And so she is really an expert on uh, Sephardic Jewish history. Um, two programs from now, we will have another expert and that's Randy Schoenberg, who's really an expert on Ashkenazi Jewish history. Uh, now, uh, our moderator today, Dror Arusi, has taught me a new word that was not previously in my vocabulary. <laughs> and that word is Ashki normative which has to do with um, the fact that uh, Jews in America today think of the Ashkenazi experience as being the Jewish experience, if I got that right. Mm -hmm. um, so Drora, please take it away. Well, thank you. And thank you to the Susan Mendez Foundation. It's wonderful to be a part of this um, in my small way. So thank you for having me and thank you for having us all here. This is uh, Wonderful. So I want to make sure that everybody here just gets a little feel before I introduce Jeannie, who's really the star of today and the star of the show. Although if you look closely at the movie, hopefully you saw my little cameo there. But um, this is really the Jeannie show. I just want to make sure that we all are aware of what we're talking about and why we're still talking about crypto jewelry when we all know it ended in 1492, right? Well, let's take a look at a little bit of uh, what we're talking about. So first I want everybody to make, to make sure that everybody understands that there was a huge ancient community across the Iberian Peninsula. We're gonna be talking today about an area within this little red circle. But if you look at all these dots, they all had um, Jewish communities there at one point or another throughout, and if you look, it, chances are went before the year 1000. Um, it, it's an ancient community that gave so much philosophy and art to the world. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when we talk about Ashkenormative in particular, and that's one of the reasons that we have the Jewish Unity Through Diversity Institute is to make sure we know that there is more to it than this. So I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of how the whole crypto community came to be. So these communities were strong, like we said, and then as time went on, there were financial issues going on in the Iberian Peninsula and religious issues. And we know I'm not going to get into the whole history of it in terms of the Muslims and the Christians conquering. Hopefully everybody will do their research on that. But I want to make sure we understand where the crypto society came from. Now, really, it really formed in 1391 when many Jews decided that they needed to convert in order to be a part of the community, in order not to be persecuted, in order to um, have more rights within the culture there. 
And that's where the first group became crypto um, Jews. Now, at that time, you also had some crypto Muslims as well. I want to make sure we understand that it wasn't only a Jewish phenomenon. Um, I'm not getting into everything here. I want to give you an overview again, just the concept. So like I said, we went to 1492, where hopefully we all know besides um, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, we also had the expulsion. Whether Columbus was a Jew or not, a crypto Jew, that's another question. I'm not going to get into it. I'm giving you little things to think about as we continue. The Alhambra decree um, had them leaving Spain. Now, the expulsion in Portugal happens a few years later, a little while later, but essentially by the end of the 1400s, there were no practicing Jews within outwardly practicing Jews in the Iberian Peninsula. Many of them went to the New World at a certain point after a few different incarnations. They uh, ended up in the New World, except that in the New World, on the next slide, the um, Inquisition followed them there as well. And that's where Jeannie's story comes into play because they continued to maintain their crypto society in the New World, in North America and in South America. So just so you understand today, there is a whole movement and a subculture, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later with our certificate, that um, builds upon these communities that know they have this Jewish connection, like Jeannie knew she had this Jewish connection, and yet don't understand how to place it. And so in that, let's just, I'm sure most of you know most of this, but I'm just gonna say, first of all, I am so happy and proud to call Jeannie a friend. Um, and she definitely comes into play as a scholar and a genealogist. She herself was born in Cuba to, to a Roman Catholic family of Spanish ancestry. And only later, as I'm sure you saw in the movie, she found out that she also had Jewish ancestry. Um, it, it's amazing the amount that she researched to, to get the 15 grandmothers. And now I believe it's 24 grandmothers at this point. 22, 22. 22, my apologies. 22 grandmothers that she traced back to her Sephardic Jewish roots. It's incredible. And since she's who we came to see, Jeannie, please tell us a little more. Thank you, Jora, and thank you, Olivia, and to the Sosa Mendes Foundation for having me here. And I hope everyone got to see the film. I don't know, uh, is it still on till like midnight tonight or, or is it finished? So we're still offering it until tomorrow night at oh, good. 10 p.m. Oh, good. Eastern so um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the motivation for the film, the uh, what started what started the the film how did it you know come about and uh and show you scenes that have never uh, been seen before for example um it was very difficult to make this is the poster of the film it was a difficult poster to make because we wanted to showcase the cross and the candelabra and the menorah and the grave and the flower and you understand now that between the stone and the flower was my own personal dilemma to what do I do when mom and dad died, knowing that mom was a Jew and knowing that dad had a hefty Jewish ancestry. So I want to show you a clip of Cordova. If we could do that now, Matthew, and then we'll talk a little bit more after that. Siete modos de guisado se guisa la merendena. La primera de la guisa es la baba de lena. Ya la hace bocaditos y la mete en una cena. Esta comida la llaman comida de merendena. A mi tío será así que le agrada beber el vino. Con el vino, 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 mucho y bien a él le vino. La segunda que la guisa es la Por ahí 
So I wanted to put this now because going to Cordoba was actually the end of my genealogical journey. You saw the beginning. I was born in Cuba. And then as I went and I followed my, uh, to be able to prove the traditional Jewish lineage, you go your mom's lineage directly. But once I reached the 22nd grandmother and uh, in Israel, they gave me a full return that we were always Jewish. And, and, you know, all that I had to go through, but I won't go there. Um, then I went searching after dad because the whole time I was searching in the early searches, my dad would always say to me, oh, why are you searching for your mom? We're more Jewish than, than your mom. And, but I had to do it this other way because I was trying to bring back the whole family. So, um, so after dad had actually already died in 2017 is only when I went to Cordoba because uh, you saw the, in the movie, you saw the castle of Don Sigler de Pinoza, and my grandmother was named Sigler de Pinoza in Cuba, my great grandmother. So I was searching all over and finally found my paternal lineage, Jewish lineage in Cordoba. That's why it's particularly striking to me. And uh, you could also see in this particular clip, as you saw in the movie, you could see the searching in the archives in Evora, Portugal. Um, these are all underground. It's freezing down there. It's amazing. I think they were built in like 1510 uh, or 1530. It's under the, like the university. And in the archives in Lisbon, in Torre do Tombo, they had all of these documents in, in boxes. And, and you saw that there were women. There was, in general, at any given moment in Torre do Tombo, there's about eight or nine women that are just trying to glue these things together. And you cannot scan and digitize them until they are perfectly preserved. So, I mean, they're scannable, that they're not going to break. That's what I mean, continue their preservation. Part of what's in Evora and the reason it has lasted all of these centuries is because it's so darn cold, right? It would never last like that in Jamaica, that's for sure. But um, there's no humidity. It's very cold. And I was able to now, as of a couple of months ago, I got uh, an organization in Israel to pay fully for the digitization of the Portuguese documents of every single uh place there was an inquisitional tribunal those should be up on their website um already and um that the money for restoring them actually came uh from the embassy uh the israeli embassy in lisbon and the money for digitizing them came from um from a dna organization that I'm still working with to digitize them around the world. So they have taken on this project with me. We've been at it since 2015. And later when we speak with Drora about the certificate of Sephardic ancestry, you'll see how that database comes into play. So um, that digitization was crucial to my finding my Jewish roots because the only thing that will be accepted in the courts in Israel um, to prove that you have a Jewish lineage, the only thing that's accepted is uh, every single document and then an Inquisition document because we don't have synagogue documents over there. We don't have cemeteries. We don't have circumcision. We don't have every, anything. The only thing that points us to being a Jew is that we would be burned uh, alive for being a Jew. Um, okay, so the next, uh, the first slide. Okay, so this is a very interesting, uh, in the film, you saw the different uh, synagogues in El Salvador. You heard uh, three of the presidents in El Salvador. And this is the most remote one. It is in a place called Barra Salada, which means uh, salted bar. And um, you can see how makeshift it is. Uh, no air conditioning, obviously. It is a community that just comes together uh, to pray, to learn, to study, 
And my husband, Michael, and I work a lot with these communities. This particular community started with about 15, 20 people who could not um, where the normative uh, Jewish community in San Salvador wouldn't sell them kosher meat or um, or any kind of a, a sh you know a bird or a chicken or anything. So uh, they had already been converted. A lot of people in all over Latin America do not believe in this uh, process and think that if you're not, what was that word, Ashke normative, whatever it is, okay. If you're not uh, Ashkenaz and we're from Lithuania, everything else just doesn't exist. And uh, these people picked up, they were accountants, they were, uh, you know, they worked in banks. These are not low level, these are people, middle class, working people. They picked themselves up, they moved an hour and a half away from El Salvador to the sea, and they set up a huge fishing community that they now are eating only fish to be able to keep kosher. It was a huge and continues to be a huge sacrifice on the family. I work all the time in Latin America <clears throat> trying to flip this narrative around. And um, sometimes I'm able, there was, uh, we were able to get them um, boxes and, you know, not boxes, pallets of matzahs for pesa. We were able to send in a shot and uh, have a whole cow um, made uh, for them to have kosher meat, but they are still living right on the sand, right on the beach, men, women, the wives, the children, they gave it all up. And this is what you see here. Um, and they're, they're praying three times a day, and it's just something to behold, really. Uh, next slide. Okay, so under the town of Fermoselle, it's right on the river between uh, Spain and Portugal. And you could see on the map where it was drawn in, in red, Fermoselle and Zamora above it. There's very little written. Uh, there's a little bit written about Fermoselle having had Jews. And that document I found in the Evora, one tiny document saying that Jews had paid taxes. Why was that so crucial? Because there was nothing indicating that there was a Jew in Fermoselle at all until I found a document in that basement between all those boxes that I pulled out. And that document said that these thousands and thousands of their currency at the time called Maravedis had been paid in 1484, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, and nine until 91. And they paid taxes for being Jews, which it was all Jews were taxed. And, uh, and then it stopped in 92. So that was the, the end of that. But this is why it was so important to go underground. So under Fermoselle are all of these tunnels that connect. It's about 2.1 miles from the beginning to the river. And underneath are these tunnels the way that you see them. They didn't have obviously electric light, but you can see um, this is my cousin Alejandra Maura, who is my cousin from the 14th generation that I met through the genealogy. And she agreed to dress as one of my grandmothers. So she was the grandmother uh, in the movie that you saw a couple of other people in Miami. But basically you can walk from one end of the village to the other underground. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> the stone and the flower situation was very painful for me because when dad died, much before mom, I knew he had, I had started the Jewish ancestry search. I knew it was not a straight line like mom, but I knew he was Jewish and I, but I was bringing a stone. Nevertheless, I uh, buried my parents right next to the Jewish, it's a secular cemetery. I buried them right next to the Jewish cemetery. Um, I, the conditions were not appropriate as you can, as you all know, for me to bury them. But I made sure that it was in a place that right behind them, it's all Jews. So uh, there's no fence. It's just a little bit of leaves there. So right by their heads, it's it's all the Jewish cemetery. And I hope no one ever builds a wall over there, but by their feet and everything, it's a secular cemetery. So now I always take the stone and the flower. It took me a very long time to 
to be able to bring that flower. I have uh, belonged as a part. I mean, I've always been Jewish, obviously, from my ancestry, but being a part of the Jewish people and it has been more than half of my entire life. So there's a lot of conditioning uh, going in there, not just from the Catholic that I had to shed, but from a Jewish point of view, there's a lot that I had to mentally deal with. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide or uh, Matthew. Okay. Um, there's a picture of my, there's a, a picture of my mom. Um, my mom was a very stylish, uh, beautiful woman, but and it's hard for me, and I certainly didn't say it in the film um, at all, but in 2014, after all the hard time that mom gave me about returning and returning the family, and it wasn't an anti-Semitic thing, it was um, just, you know, she was a socialite, it just, just wasn't done by a Cuban socialite, but she saw my struggle, she saw everything that I went to, so in 2014, she asked to see our rabbi, and I couldn't handle it emotionally. This has been a very difficult journey for me. And my husband took her to see the rabbi, and she told him uh, she was 86. She did not want to die Catholic. So by virtue of the decree that had been written in Israel, mom returned. And uh, the rabbi said she needed to do one mitzvah. So she lit candles. And uh, she went immediately a couple days later into the deepest of Alzheimer's that you can imagine. And mom never returned to me uh, to be able to ask her why she had done that. So mom died as a Jew, um, officially, because she had to take it on. And, um, and she was a beautiful woman and, and died a beautiful woman. Uh, Matthew, could we, I can't handle talking about this anymore. Uh, can we look at the last uh, video? I want to talk about why those um, those players are even a part of this movie. So from the map, right across the river is Miranda do Tauro. On the other side is Fermosella, where my family was born. When I was growing up and the whole time I was a baby, my grandparents were speaking a language that my sister and I, my sister is four years older, that my sister and I remember and we just didn't know what it was. And at some time, I thought it could be Ladino. I was always looking for that Jewish connection. And then one day, walking in the villages in Miranda, looking for clues and looking for this and looking for that, I hear a group of men and women talking this language, Mirandes, which I later learned is the third language of Portugal with only five or 6,000 people still left in the world that are speaking it. So for the movie... I looked for somebody that could play the music that my grandfather used to sing to me when I was going to bed as a baby in Cuba. And I found my, my cousin that lives there. She found this group. They were playing the bagpipes. And the elder man who is in his 90s, up I climbed that mountain with them. I thought I was going to die. I wasn't going to make it to the film. Um, so we were up there and he sang to my face and he sang La Pastorica. Unfortunately, you don't hear their music because of the amount of wind that there was up there. It was crazy. We were up about 5,000 feet. We climbed on the rocks with nothing. I, I wasn't expecting it. They're shepherds, so they just flew up and I got up there like <clears throat> with the director and everybody else. So he sang La Pastorica to me up on that jagged stone. And as he did so, his face transformed to my granddad's face, singing me this lullaby up on the mountain. And uh, they literally had to hold me up. So it was such a meaningful moment for me. I think that uh, a lot of people ask me what was my 
key moment? What was the most impressive moment I can say about the film? And the most impressive moment was this, which may not translate like, wow, out of everything up and down, you know, all of these villages and everything. But the reality is, is that this particular moment was the moment of, wow, I finally came full circle being with these uh, gentlemen up here. Um, they, uh, we actually went back to their house. He, they, they make all their own instruments practically in an hour. We sat down and he made me a flute, uh, an original flute. I have incredible memories of making the film, which was last year, but the most important was, uh, this particular moment. Um, a lot of people have asked me why now I wrote my first books in 2010 so why now is that I've gotten to a point where I've spoken all over the world. I, I, I Zoom after COVID, everybody Zoom. I've reached thousands of people and thousands of people telling the story just to, to be able to, to historically put a pin in this moment in time lost to Jewish history. And I figured as much as I did not want to do this because I am way too emotional, it, it kills me. I cry every time I see the movie. I have a difficult time handling it. Um, I, whenever I have to do a live appearance in the movie, I'm sitting there in my chair trying not to go. It was very painful, a journey, but it was the time in moment in time that I needed to leave it out there um, because it was just time. And I had to put everything aside to, to make this happen. Um, so that is why the movie is was now. Um, I, I could not continue to reach as many people as I could with something like this, which will continue. Um, also, uh, just back to the digitization, Anyone that comes to me, and it's between five and 600 emails that I get a month, anyone that comes to me um, looking to find their ancestry, uh, all of this digitization in a big way, Mexico, uh, Inquisition, Cartagena, Colombia, Spain, I've only been, Canary Islands, Peru, I mean, I've only been super successful in Portugal. Um, I started digitizing myself. And as a result of digitizing myself, I have been all over the world and my database is on, different from all other databases because it is not following, okay, the name Alvarez means this and the name Menendez means that. That's not what this does. What this does is try to trace the diaspora from uh, east to west of the names and the, and the families and the genealogy that's in there. I have personally been working on this myself with these hands, with no one else helping. I have over 100,000 names in the database. Dora will talk a little bit uh, in a minute about you know, what this uh, entails uh, with this database. I uh, went to see the Pope uh, last year for the uh, information that's in the secret archives. I have an appointment again, the Vatican in two weeks. And this time I am meeting inside the secret archives with the Cardinal that is the keeper of all such things. So I am hoping to be able to get out of the secret archives, the missing inquisition records. Uh, they have been pretty open with me. They have uh, been, they have taken information out as has been requested. So I am really hoping that that last barrier and the irony of standing in the Vatican and talking to the Pope and being with the Cardinals is had I been Catholic and not a Jew, I would never have been accepted in there. Um, so it's just kind of, they, they walk on eggs and they I'm in there as a Jew and they're opening all this vault up as patrimony of the Jewish people. So Drora, Huh. <laughs> Are we going to take a breath? <laughs> so we're going to go back to Olivia first. So, yes. So um, audience members, uh, take in what you just heard. And now is the opportunity for you to add more questions into that chat box. Uh, Drora is accumulating them. 
Jora, I should say, is coming to us from Israel. I didn't mention that before. Um, she is um, going to moderate your questions, but before she does that, I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about what we have here upcoming at the Sousa Mendez Foundation. We have one program left in May, and that's on May 19th. And that's a program called Victory in Algiers, the Jewish heroes of North Africa who changed the course of World War II. Many people don't know that uh, the European Holocaust actually extended to North Africa, that um, there were Jews there who were in danger for their lives, uh, both North African Jews and also European Jews who had been sent there. And there is this amazing uh, resistance that happened in Algeria when uh, about 300 um, Jews of Algeria led by a man named Jose Albuquer, Albuquer was his name, um, uh, helped the ally, allies to land in Algeria. Uh, these Jewish resistance heroes actually uh, captured the city of Algiers. They captured the communication of the city. They captured um, the administration. I mean, they captured all of the uh, infrastructure of the city so that the Americans could land. And it's an amazing story that's totally unknown. Uh, it's one of the only or maybe the only Jewish resistance story that actually changed the course of World War II and saved American lives. So it's a it's a, an event you won't want to miss. Um, it is a paid program like today, but we do have generous sponsors, and that is Mimi and Marvin Sandler. Thank you to the Sandler couple. So if you would like to have a sponsored ticket, just send us an email saying need a ticket, and that ticket will be yours. So we hope we'll have a nice big turnout for that program on May 19th. The following program is on June 9th, and there we will meet another uh, virtuosic Jewish genealogist, Randy Schoenberg, in a program called Randy Schoenberg's Time Travel Through Jewish History. And we're going to be showing his new film called Fioretta, where he traces his ancestry uh, back multiple centuries, just like Jeannie. <laughs> and uh, so it's quite thrilling to go on these rides through history with these amazing genealogists. So that is something to look forward to on June 9th. But right now we're going to see a little trailer of the film about Algeria. Algiers actually had an impact on the war effort. Indeed, it's the only Jewish resistance movement that really had an impact on the war effort and in the process saved American lives. There are supposed to be about 800 or so insurgents show up for the uprising. Only a few hundred showed up. They went through with their plan anyway. Of the 388, 315 were Jewish. Abul Kher was the local leader of the Jewish resistance movement at the time, about 20 years old. For the reasons evident, for them, the fight against Hitler was a fight for life. It was the first large joint operation between the Americans and the British, even though they didn't see eye to eye. Roosevelt knows we have to fight the Germans and the Italians somewhere in 1942. We have to have a success when we go after them. North Africa is the place to do it. Fewer than 400 people took the entire city of Algiers and kept it under their control. It was a massive operation behind the scenes. The most important piece of territory in the European theater of war at that moment. It was a dramatic movement of resistance, and it was a statement. Operation Torch is the longest invasion ever mounted in the history of the world. It was absolutely crucial to the outcome of the war.
you will be getting an email after today's program with links on how to sign up. And so Drura, take it away. Thank you. So there are some really nice questions here. And I think we're gonna talk about the certificate throughout because I think it's gonna come up. So let's start with just a few questions that some of our participants have asked. So one of the questions that came up is, what made you think you had a connection to Judaism? What was the... So, so that's like the most existential question of all, because it was just something that I felt and I felt without knowing why I was feeling it. It is something that every single person that contacts me that doesn't, has not read my books, has not seen my stuff, that their first thing is, I don't know why, but I just feel Jewish. It mm -hmm. is not explainable. It is, I've always said, this is not a journey of the blood. This is not a journey of DNA. My sister couldn't care less, you know, Christmas tree, whatever. It's not that she has to be Jewish, but she couldn't care less about the ancestry. Um, so I think that it is a journey of the soul. Um, you know, it might be beyond that for, uh, you know, it's not blood. I know we have to go through our mother's blood and, uh, I, I'm not sure what it is, but it feels like something deeper, something more, um, I, I, I can't explain, but something that fills you up more whole than, uh, just a DNA trait, like your hair is brown. So. It's, I'm not answering it well, but that's the only answer I have. I think that is the answer. And then you decided to take it all the way and go the most strict um, international uh, conversion that you can do. And that was one of the questions came up. What made you decide to convert that way? Okay, so I spent a couple of years at the, um, uh, what shall I call it, uh, Reconstructionist, maybe a year at the Reconstructionist Synagogue. I loved it. Um, that's where I got my start and getting my feet wet. But there was a lot of this uh, kumbaya uh, stuff going. And not at all. I had read a couple of hundred books on Judaism and what it means to be a Jew and the responsibility, the social responsibility and all of this. And it was too uh, fluffy and very similar to where I had come from. Um, and I was trying to make this huge change in my life. Then I spent uh, another year at the Reform Synagogue. I was starting out easy. I wasn't going to go, uh, no pun intended, whole hog, you know, to begin with. But it, I went to the Reform. And um, for me, it didn't work. I was coming alone. If you recall, I didn't convert my kids. So I was a single woman. Uh, and I wasn't. I was maybe 29, 30 years old. And um, there were a lot of clicks. It was a social environment and a lot of clicks, and I didn't fit into any of them. And uh, nobody even looked my way. And that's not saying anything because it was reform. I'm not by any means being judgmental. I'm just saying in the neighborhood where I live, the reform synagogue has 3,300 families. The conservative has about 600. And where I go, it's 50. So, you know, you can understand it was just, I, I didn't fit in, in the conservative. Also, I didn't fit in. Um, and then I finally found this little Orthodox synagogue and I, I felt I fit in. I was making such a ruckus in my family that I felt, you know, I, let me just go the whole way. And it fit me better because I was used to the structure and the organization, let's say, of prayer and worship from you know a strict Catholic upbringing, and so that kind of because you found your place and then you did your genealogy, you decided that you needed to help other people connect. And I want to make sure that uh, we put you mentioned DNA and somebody asked about DNA, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking genealogy, and so um, can you explain first of all how you find these communities and how you help them and Right. So I became very active. Uh, uh, social media started in about 2010. My uh, finding all of this information out was about 2010. 
2011, and I became active on social media, as I was finding out, I decided I was going to share this with everyone out there because nobody else in my family wanted to hear it. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll share it with people who might want to hear it. And then sure enough, uh, all over Latin America, people started asking me questions, coming to me the very same way. And um, to me, if people wanted to connect with their Jewish roots, I never did it for them. I wrote a book, How I Found My 15 Grandmothers. The text of that book is up on Dora's website. We'll talk about that in a minute, not on mine, on hers. And uh, you can access it free of charge. And, and that way, when they, I, I never talked about religion. Um, I chose the path of orthodoxy or traditional, let's say, you know, we're not going around wearing, you know, black hats and uh, uh, super traditional. And we, we do go to your young Israel, so it's orthodox, but never in any talk to any person that ever comes to me, does the word uh, of religion come up. I explain what each you know, all the different levels. Everybody has to do this the way that they can. And for me personally, which is why I don't, if people are returning to the Jewish people after 500 years, honestly, I don't care what they, honestly, I, I don't. It's, I don't care what they do on Saturday. To me, it is a return that accepts that they had Jewish roots and Sephardic roots, and it makes them be friends of the Jewish people and to love the Jewish people, and we need those friends. So honestly, I don't care what they're eating, and I don't push religion in any way. I have many templates that I have made, very long templates, where I... Uh, decide more or less what the reader wants, the people that write me want. They want to return, they want to study, they want to learn, it's one template. They just want to know because they want to know and nothing else, then it's another template. And I kind of gauge it with them and I usually only have one interaction and then they go off and do their own thing. And, and that DNA, was right, DNA, Everybody asks me about DNA. Look, if you do a DNA test and you come up with 50% Sephardic DNA, like my mom, for example, 48% Sephardic, mom came up with that and 18% Ashkenaz. I have no idea where that is from because I have every single document on mom known to man. But we had 48% uh, Sephardic. That is something to take a look at. Um, whoa, what's going on here with a 40 But it doesn't count for anything in the real world let's say but it does allow you to explore it in a much if you come up with 2.6 percent then you know it's a different level of understanding your dna and that's really where your idea for the certificate of spartic ancestry came to be is to allow people if, if i may you can interrupt me if you want but uh to allow people to share their ancestry to make sure that they have a connection to what their heritage is. And again, we're not saying anybody is religious by birth, or sorry, Jewish by birth. Um, and that's not the concept of the Sephardic certificate. The certificate of Sephardic ancestry particularly is there for, to help people discover their own heritage through the genealogy, through the databases that you can get either on Jeannie's website or that she, um, generously put also on the Spartac certificate website, which uh, Lewis will share. Um, and really there's instructions there as well, which Jeannie has posted, how to start your journey. If you wanna see, I saw that somebody asked, you know, do you know these people? That's not how we can help you. We can help point you in the direction of the databases. We can help you on your journey. There are genealogists who do this. And if you need a recommendation, I'm happy to recommend. We don't get anything from that, neither myself nor Cheney. We just happen to know people that we trust. But the really, there are so many people around the world, I mean, thousands and thousands who are just researching because they feel a connection and they want to feel this pride in their heritage as well. And like Jeannie said, we can use as much feel good connections as we can at this point. So uh, no, that let was me just, I will interrupt you, not interrupt you, but I will interject yes. that those scenes that you see in El Salvador and in Guatemala, I think there was a couple in Guatemala, they are people that have changed their lives. They keep 
all, I mean, they keep everything. They have lost their jobs because they don't work on Saturday. There's no monkey business with these people. They bring from the big city to the little uh, towns. They bring mattresses that they sleep on. And the men, women, children, everybody, and they praying and they're praying and they're praying and they're learning Hebrew and they're reading and, and studying. And, and I, so then they're not getting meat. They're not getting chicken. Uh, they're not being recognized as Jews for whatever reason, you know, because this, the conversion wasn't good enough because whatever, there's, there's hundreds of reasons. And I figured, and I, I spoke to Drawer about it, I said, I could be wrong, but I think that if we check their genealogies and we have a team that checks it, and we do have a team that checks it, it's not just me. Uh, there's a whole team that has to sign off on everyone that comes to us. And it gives them pride to hang this certificate after we check their genealogy up on the wall that can make the place for having to move their families to buy fish to, to fish, so not to get a chicken, something as silly, not, I'm sorry, not silly, but something as small as that, then maybe we could be part. So, you know, we've been, Dora, how long now? About a year and a half? Two? Something like that, you know. One yeah, year. about two years. And it took a lot of work to get this, but the faces of the videos that we make of the people, what they say up on social media, they are just bursting with pride because of the Sephardic Ancestry Certificate. So, you know, it's doing its job. They're still not getting their chicken as hard as I try, um, but they're getting their certificates. Um, and then there was a great question that just popped up. How can the rest of us help the people who are not accepted? Um, I think that the most important thing that anybody can do is if, Somebody walks up to you and says, um, I feel Jewish, or you see a face at the community center, or you see a face at the synagogue, and it just looks a little off, and it looks a little different than everybody else. I think that what the easiest thing is just extend a hand. Hi, tell me a little bit about yourself, and you will just hear the outpouring. And I would say that that's pretty much what what each and every one of you can do is just not reject, but listen first. And, um, you know, if a Purim party is coming up, come to the Purim party, a log bomb or barbecue, whatever it is, just, hey, why don't you come and join us? You know, in two weeks, we're having a barbecue. And just, you know, embrace them, even if just for a moment of their lives, it would really mean the world. Thank you. And there, there are questions that I want to acknowledge, but I am also aware of the time. So I, we can't get into the whole great conspiracies across South America, but I do encourage you either through the foundation or through my website to reach out. I'm happy to share some articles about um, the conspiracies that continued or about the inquisition that continued through the 1800s uh, across South America. There is a question and you can tell me if you uh, are open to answering it right now. Did the Catholic Church ever apologized for the Inquisition? So yes, yeah, so in 1992, 500 years after 1492, um, the church did, I don't remember what Pope it was at the time, but they did issue a an apology that a lot of people um, felt it wasn't really an apology, but so coming out and saying we apologize that not but if you google it you will see that in 1992 there was a special sort of uh apology also in 1992 is when jews um so the rabbis wanted no one to go back to spain for 500 years this was a, a i think it's called a harem a, a, i don't know what it's called but yeah yeah, a harem, not to go back to Spain. So you will note that most of the Jews in the communities that are established now were little by little filling in, but that influx from Morocco and Turkey and all that only took place after the 500 years um, had taken place. Now, I will tell you something, and I know we're pressed for time, but I think along the apology lines, 
Uh, in February, I, I was invited by the ambassador to Spain to show my film at the parliament. And by the way, because Olivia, I know her well, and I love Olivia dearly, um, she got ahead of me with showing the film because right now it's only in film festivals and you can only see it in the city that you're in. So, you know, it, this was something unusual, but I, I did show the film at the parliament and there was supposed to be an interfaith discussion afterwards. Sitting next to me was the cardinal that um, is in the EU. And on the other side of me was the head uh, cardinal or priest archbishop of Belgium, who super Catholic country. And the movie went on, people asked questions and answers. Nobody asked them anything. And 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 I mean, that why are they there? So like two minutes before it was going, they're gonna kick us out of the room, this huge parliament room. I turned to them and I said, I have a question for you. And they blanched. And my question was, so literally, it's on film. So what did you think of the film? And the, they got up and started apologizing for the Inquisition. And I was so embarrassed that I'm like, no, 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 you don't have to do that. But I, you know, I let it go. But they literally got up and apologized for the Inquisition when all I said was, so what'd you think of the film? So I think that it's on the tip of their tongues. I think it's on the tip of their minds. I think that there are norms and things in place that don't allow them to be so open. Uh, it's a huge establishment. It's a huge firm. I'm not excusing them but by the very fact that they're taking somebody like me into uh, the secret archives to find what I need to bring to the world about the Inquisition. I think that that's saying it without saying it. And I think one of the questions that came up, you addressed it a little bit. Um, you said that you heard a language that you didn't know what it was and somebody asked if it was Ladino. And you specifically said it wasn't, but can you expand upon that a little bit? How? Right. So I, I, I came to the point in my research that I was trying to figure out this language. My sister and I aren't nuts. I was two, three, and she was four years old or so, you know, a, a six, seven year old. And, you know, we heard it until we came to the States and these lullabies. And I came into the States at four, she was eight. And then my grandparents stopped speaking it or singing in it. And um, so I started online looking up and hearing uh, Ladino lullabies. And it wasn't Ladino, it wasn't Solitreo, it wasn't Castilian, it wasn't Spanish, it wasn't Portuguese. And that's when I heard it being uh, spoken in the village of Miranda as I was searching through uh, looking for symbols. So uh, it was Mirandes. So we're getting to the end of the hour. We have just five minutes left. And so now I'd like to ask each of you to turn your attention to your final thoughts, just whatever you would like to leave with our audience today, starting with you, Jeannie. That, first of all, I'm really overjoyed that a lot of you were able to see this movie. As I've said before, this was not an easy movie to make. I didn't at any point feel that it would be effective for anybody if I sugarcoated anything, including my adult children. When my adult children speak and you heard them speak, they're speaking through the mouths of a four-year-old and an 11-year-old. And it was very painful. I didn't cut them out. I didn't censor them. Um, I actually realized, as I, I was not present when they were interviewed, I actually realized how hurt they must have been, how difficult it must have been. And I didn't realize until 35 years later, and it made me very sad that as a mom, I had just, you know, run through this and, and done that to them. I called them uh, um, two, three months ago or so, and I, I, I said, I want to apologize for the pain I caused you. And my daughter, she's very similar to me, and she's strong. You know, she's, what pain, mom? What are you talking about? But you know, she didn't get her Pop-Tarts and that still hurts me. Um, so I had to make this to be very raw, to be very effective. So just want everybody to know that there is absolutely nothing sugar-coated over here. Um, this is how it is. It is how it was. 
And it is this way for many, many people more like me. Dora? Well, for me today was just so representative of what we talk about in terms of the Jewish unity through diversity. We're talking about Jeannie's story from the Inquisition till today. We're talking about um, the Susan Mendes and talking about my grandparents that all four were Holocaust survivors um, and the concept of it being Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel. And there's just so much of the Jewish people that come together and we all have them. One of the things that really hit me when I sp spoke to Jeannie at one point, she says she still smells like it's it you can she can smell the auto de fe or she can smell the burning from that time period and i know that i had dreams as if i was in a concentration camp and it's this internal concept of we're all connected to our roots we're all connected to our heritage and we're all connected to each other and so i really appreciate being here today and being a part together with all of you so thank you olivia Great. And so we always look for opportunities to bring our stories back to Portugal to honor our hero who was Portuguese. And Portugal was the country through which many of us escaped, our families escaped, who were saved by Sousa Mendes. So um, Portugal has a complex Jewish history. There will be a museum opening in a couple of years in Lisbon called Tikva, meaning hope. And it's the J Jewish Museum of Lisbon being uh, designed by um, uh, Liebeskind, Daniel Liebeskind. Uh, at the same time, we at the Susan Mendes Foundation are involved in another museum uh, in Portugal that is opening this July. And that is a museum to our hero, Susan Mendes, in his own home. So the idea of preserving memory, which is really what you, Jeannie, and you, Draw are doing, is itself a mitzvah and so important. And so you too are heroes, and I want to thank you for thank that. You. Thank you. And to our audience that comes to our programs week after week, thanks for being there, and we'll see you next time. And you do have up until tomorrow night at 10 p.m. to see the film if you haven't finished it yet. So thank you all and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.